Jen. Uh, uh, first off, thanks for sitting down with me. Um, I know obviously this time of year is very busy for a lot of people, typically the holiday season approaching. Um, so a lot of people are My not. My pleasure. Yeah, and a lot of people are not uh, the most free right now. So thanks for making some time for me. Um, so a couple of things that we're going to talk about today um, are specifically uh, the ideas of uh, racism and COVID and how those have trickled into the political parties and how that has divided our country um, beyond many people's belief. Um, so first I want to ask, um, what is your what is your take on the country being racist and how do you think that applies to our current presidency? So in general, I think it's most productive to think about race um, and racism as um, with as like an institutional issue and also within the context of the history of our country. So going all the way back, um, as we all know, our country was founded on slavery and the wealth that was built among the white people that were here um, was built on the exploitation of slaves. So from that point, um, after the end of slavery, um, things obviously shifted um, and with the failures of the reconstruction period, um, black people, although they were technically free, were shut out from economic opportunity. Um, we see this most recently in um, the early 1900s, how black individuals were not allowed to benefit from the GI Bill, um, which enabled a lot of white Americans, including like Italian Americans, Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, um, it allowed them all to access um, higher education for free, something that was like previously inaccessible to them, um, as well as like uh, housing loan programs. So FHA and VA loans, um, those are examples I think of institutional racism and how black people were prevented from accumulating wealth. And so when you look at wealth in our country, um, it's largely divided because of these like policies um, and institutions that have divided people um, on race lines according to economic opportunity. So that's kind of how I think about racism. Of course, you mm -hmm. also have the issue. I think that like most people tend to think about like the KKK or which is also an institution, but like think about like racist individuals. I think um, Trump is an example of a racist individual who uses race, racist rhetoric um, to really divide people. Um, one of the ways, yeah. I, does that answer your question or uh, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm going yeah. in the right direction? No, yeah, that was good. Um, if I can really quick uh, unpack something that um, sure, you said please. there, and again, that's really applicable to what we're gonna be talking about, um, that you believe Trump is racist, is that right? I mean, I think that, as I said before, I think the most productive focus that we can have mm -hmm. when we talk about racism is by fo focusing on the institutions that perpetuate wealth inequality um, among racial lines. Um, and I think that when we talk about something is racist, I think it's most productive to talk about institutions. Like, I don't know what is in Trump's heart, but mm -hmm. what I do know is some of the rhetoric that he's used from the beginning of his campaign when he started calling um, Mexican immigrants rapists and just like really bad guys, drug dealers, you know, from like the beginning of his presidency when he was talking about shithole countries, specifically mm -hmm. referring to countries where Black people live, um, to the <laughs> Muslim ban and how he boxed out um, predominantly Muslim countries from immigrating and seeking asylum in the United States. I think those are all examples um, of racist acts. Um, I'm not really interested in how he feels or what he believes, but I think that it's undeniable that he has stoked racist tensions in this country and just further divided us. 
Yeah, I think I think you bring up a good point by saying that, um, because I think that um, while what he has said done, you you couldn't necessarily say for sure in some in some cases that that is a direct racist thing, but it's about as close as you can get without someone saying, okay, this is like way too far. You know what I'm saying? Um, because some people will agree with that, obviously, um, as they did with, um, you know, those who voted for him and those who still support him. Um, but it's also a good, um, a good take that you have uh, on that. Um, Thanks. I mean, I should be clear and say that I do think he's taken things way too far too. Like, yeah. I think that when you look at like, the ways in which um, like Charlottesville is another great example, right? So like when he was equating Black Lives Matter protesters with white nationalists and saying there are good people on both sides, mm -hmm. like this, um, this impulse to put um, activists who are fighting for human rights and hate groups that are perpetuating racial violence on the same level and just saying like, sometimes we disagree. Like to me, that is just like undeniably um, fundamentally racist. Like that's a racist thing to say to mm -hmm. equate those two groups as somehow similar. Yeah. And I, I think also um, one thing that you said, I, I don't mean to cut you off or anything like that. Um, one thing that you'd said earlier as well is you don't know what's in Trump's heart, um, which again, I think that that is something that with me personally, I think that that's something that Trump didn't do very well. One thing, like off the bat, obviously there's other stuff that we could sit here and debate all day about. Um, but one thing that he didn't do very well was kind of care being careful with his words. He didn't really have a filter. Um, so while maybe his, what he actually believes is good or bad um, or racist or not, what he said is undeniable in his comments or he wasn't undeniable in his comments, if that makes sense. Right. And most importantly, the impact, the consequence of his words and actions were mm -hmm. fundamentally harmful to people of color. Right. And right. so does it matter what he thinks or what he says? Like, I don't care. Like what matters right. is how it's hurt people. Right. And how, how that's perceived amongst populations. Um, so if we can shift gears a little bit um, to the kind of the issue of COVID, um, and how that obviously has dramatically impacted um, not only uh, America, but the world. Um, how do you see the how, how politics have impacted COVID and how that's impacted the population in turn, if that makes sense? Sure. I mean, I just, I'm so sick of talking about Trump, but it's just impossible to have this conversation. Um, without focusing on him because I think he has played a central role in dividing this country, um, specifically when it comes to COVID. I think that we could probably agree that any other, <laughs> any other leader, um, any other president in history, um, Republican or Democrat would have taken a national tragedy. Um, and, you know, this, this really, scary and awful situation we're in. I think, was it Wednesday that more people died in one day than died on 9-11? Um, like any, <laughs> it, it, this should not be a political issue, but Trump has um, done what he does best, which is to make it one and to make it a divisive thing to create, a, um, to basically like, um, he has treated masks as this like symbolic gesture of political alliance, which is just so tragic and dangerous. Um, there's just no, it's just not a both sides kind of issue, right? Like it's as simple, it's as simple as if everyone wore masks, fewer people would die. So why can't we just agree that, that they're a good thing? Um, so yeah, I think that when you look at COVID and when you look at the political division, I think the political division is the reason why the United States is handling COVID worse than any other country in the world. I don't think there's a question about that. Yeah. And, and that's something that, um, I, I think is ki I, kind of dumb, um, to relate to if I can kind of continue this, that 
people kind of play that role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree with what you say. I don't think, again, I don't think that anyone would um, say that that should have been justified. Um, I But I think it's important to look at that also as well because of the reason, because we're, you know, campaigning that Black Lives Matter, which no one's disagreeing with that, well, at least in our conversation here. Um, but I'm not, I personally, I just think that that, I, I just don't know if it was solely because of race. Again, it matters, I think, because uh, well, his race matters is what I'm saying, um, because that's obviously an issue. You know, I, neither of us are denying that, that the people of color are more likely to be uh, brutally and wrongfully murdered um, by those involved in law enforcement. Right, and that's the point, right? Like, that's... Right. Like that's, that's, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like not only are people of color more likely to be murdered. Um, did you know that women of color are three times more? Uh, did you have any other uh, topics you want to discuss while I have you that you think would be important to this? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, Do you have any other, basically any other branches of anything that you want to branch off of? Because I want to give you, obviously, the full opportunity to say what you want to say. You and I had started a conversation that we never finished about um, the results of the election. We could talk about that. Yeah, we can. Do you want to, where, where did if we, you want you know, to? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, do you know where we ended off? Because off the top, I know we talked about it, but off the top of my head, I don't know where we finished. I mean, I guess I would just be curious to hear what you think. Uh, I think that um, I, I don't think that um, Trump campaigning still um, is a relevant or be important. Um, seeing as this is the way that things seem to be going is that we're going into a Biden presidency um, come January. Um I think that another thing that is very interesting, and I again, I don't think this is going to happen. Um, this is, again, this is just what would end up happening, I believe. Quote me if I'm wrong, or don't quote me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, if there is, uh, what do you call it, evidence of voter fraud, I guess, um, then what would end up happening is that essentially the states would go to one vote a state by Congress or it's by the how it's by someone. I, I again, I don't hundred percent know. I'm not super educated on this. Um, and at that point, more states voted red than blue. Obviously, the electoral plays a different role than just a, one per state. If that makes sense, if I make sense in what I'm saying, um, I put my foot in my mouth a lot. So if I'm saying something no, that fine. doesn't make sense, correct me. Um, Do you think there was voter fraud? I I I think there I think there was, but I don't think it matters. Why do you think there was? So on graphs, um, there were, again, if these graphs are wrong, then I'm wrong. So I, this is what I'm basing my information off of, um, that there were more than 100,000 mail-in ballots that, uh, what was it, would have been, when was election day? What was the date? Was it the 4th? November 3rd. 3rd. 4th. So the, so the I don't know. Somewhere in that area. So the day of election day, the polls close, and then... Uh, six hours later or somewhere in that area overnight, there were a hundred and something thousand ballots for Biden, all for Biden that went in. And instead of a straight, you know, kind of a going up, going up, going up, it went vertical and then plateaued. So I think that that's just an interesting graph that could have just been an error in the system. That could have been someone made a graph that they wanted people to click on to get money and revenue from that. I don't know, but I think that the gap between Biden and Trump at this point, I think is too large. So even if there was any voter fraud, I don't think that it matters, if that makes sense. So you think that Biden lawfully won the election? Right, yeah. I, I think that, I, th- I think there was voter fraud, but it doesn't matter because the gap was way too big that even if there was that much voter fraud, that it doesn't matter at that point because the popular vote so- is millions away. 
so can I can I kind of so I don't think there was any voter fraud. Uh-huh. Um, can I kind of tell you why I think that the idea of voter fraud is a conspiracy theory? Oh, I love, I love conspiracy created theories. Created by Trump. I love conspiracy theories. Go on. I'm here for okay. this. <laughs> so basically, long, long, long before the election, it's like, I don't even know if this probably started before the campaign. Actually, you know when it started was, I don't know this for a fact, but mm-hmm. when President Trump would, after he won, when he was talking about the 2016 election, mm-hmm. um, from my perspective, he was having a hard time reconciling having lost the popular vote. And he, he won the Electoral College, but he lost the popular vote in 2016. In 2016. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that was when he started talking about fake ballots, fake like voter fraud, like all of these problems with the election. Let me just kind of back up and say that the reason why I think this topic is so important is because Mm -hmm. the foundation of our democracy lies in free and fair elections. And I think to have a president that is, that is behind conspiracy theories is just the most destructive and dangerous thing that I don't think our country will ever recover from. Um, And I think that he knows it's a lie. So, okay, so going forward. So he started talking about all of the voter fraud and all of the problems with voting systems throughout our country right after he won and, you know, it eventually he shifted his focus to the upcoming election. When coronavirus um, happened, Democrats in general were behind a lot of efforts to make voting by mail more accessible, knowing that we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that the only safe way to ensure that as many people as possible could safely vote would be to vote by mail. And Republicans with behind Trump's leadership worked to um, not allow these things to happen. Now this is like, this has a long history, right? Like in general, um, claiming voter fraud has been a way for the Republican party to um, try and make it more difficult for people to vote. And so things like, voter ID laws, um, clearing the voting rolls if people haven't voted for so many years. Um, I think they did that in Ohio. Like there are all these different kinds of voter suppression tactics um, that have been largely deployed by Republicans. And President Trump came out and explicitly said, you know, he sometimes, as you know, says the quiet part out loud. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he explicitly said, that if everyone voted, Republicans would never win another election. And so these voter suppression tactics that go way back, you know, all the way back to the Voting Rights Act in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so there's there's racial implications here, a party division. So coming back to, to like modern day and the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. So as Democrats were trying to make from like mail-in voting more accessible, This is something that Republicans were fighting, saying that it wasn't going to be secure, it wasn't going to be safe, even there was no foundation for saying that. And actually, many states um, have been doing absentee and mail-in voting, you know, for years. President Trump himself voted by mail in Florida. Um, So, okay. So President Trump told all of his supporters to expect all of this fraud. He told them all to vote in person. Meanwhile, parallel to this happening, you have the coronavirus pandemic where Democrats in general are veering more towards staying home, wearing masks, being careful. And you have Republicans Mm -hmm. who are saying, what's the big deal? I'm going to live my life. I'm going to go do my things. And of course, I'm going to vote in person because that's what President Trump told me to do. Mm -hmm. And so then come elect. So, okay. Then leading up to the election, as things got closer, there were some cases um, Democrats wanted. So there's all these issues around when states can start counting their absentee ballots. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, in order to get the results in as quickly as possible, you really need policies that say that you can at least open the envelopes, like verify the signature, open the envelopes and stack up the ballots to get them ready to count. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of states, including Pennsylvania, um, they were not allowed to even open the envelopes until Tuesday, until election day. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they weren't allowed to start opening them uh, mail-in votes until the polls closed. Right. And so this created a situation where, of course, election day results, you, you have to count the, um, in most cases, you're counting the in-person ballots first. And so, of course, logically, this makes so much sense, right? It creates a situation where it looks like President Trump is doing really, really well mm -hmm. in states, in swing states. And then you get in the, you start counting the mail-in ballots. And of course the graph looks like that because the people that voted by mail are Democrats. And in 